Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? We're good? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, we're really, truly delighted to be part of this dialogue. Uh, and we wanted to start with a special word of thanks to, to Masha and to the incredible organizing team and to all of our fellow panelists for creating such a generative space. Uh, so as just mentioned, I'm Kendra Kinsey from Cornell University, and I'll be presenting together today with, with Hilary Faxon. Uh, and I'm speaking today from Amman in, in West Asia on land that has, has historically sheltered many diverse groups and endured many colonial configurations, including most recently Ottoman, British, and American imperial iterations. Today, we'll be speaking quite a bit about land as we present work that approaches smart infrastructures through the lens of interconnected lands, labor, and livelihood struggles in what we're calling the critical geographies of smart development. So our remarks today are the outgrowth of efforts to think relationally about the emergence and impacts of smart infrastructure from the hinterlands of the metropole. We come to this collaboration from separate long-term ethnographic research in Jordan and Myanmar, and from the productive challenges that we faced in trying to work through the phenomena we've observed in these different contexts. In my own research on smart, grid, smart grids and digital mobilization in Jordan, I've been struck by the creative ways that Amanis reconfigure their living spaces to beat back icy winter winds and skyrocketing electricity bills. Seeing the ubiquity of low cost analog hacks troubled any neat or tidy reading of what a smart grid is and raised questions for me about how diverse groups of Amanis inhabited dreams of urban smartness. And during Hillary's research in Myanmar, she became interested in how surging internet access enabled by telecom liberalization reshaped agrarian production, communities, and politics. As she noticed telecom towers, like the one here in the image on the right, proliferating in rice paddies and military bases, she started to ask how these infrastructures were being built on landscapes marked by histories of violent dispossession. In our talk today, we positioned the development of smart infrastructures as a political act that intersects in powerful ways with ongoing decolonial struggles in the, in the uneven landscapes of the post-colonial world. Both Jordan and Myanmar are former British colonies that experienced a buoyant turn towards democracy in the 2010s, and one accompanied by significant investment flows into the promise of development through digital initiatives. And yet our research demonstrates that the algorithmically governed infrastructures of the smart grid and the smart farm were built in and through landscapes of dispossession. And that the ways that users inhabit these infrastructures are profoundly marked by intersecting racial and class exclusions. Drawing on insights from feminist post-colonial scholarship, we argue for provincializing smart initiatives within ongoing grounded struggles over land, labor, and livelihoods. By starting from these place-based dynamics, we offer a view of smart development as relational and emergent from rooted power relations. We take inspiration from work that resists fetishizing the global and the local, asking instead how multi-scalar actors and practices contribute to structures of power and inequality that are place-based, but not place-bound. And here we've found great inspiration from many of the thinkers here at this conference, like Phoebe Sangers and Shannon Mattern, as well as thinkers like Iona Data, uh, Madeline Fairbairn, and Marissa Duarte. A big motivation for our work is the linkage that we see between rural and urban infrastructures and processes, a linkage that, of course, is so richly foregrounded here in this workshop. Mobile phone apps, solar panel sensors, and telecom towers form discrete nodes within smart infrastructures, which often trouble the binaries of rural and urban north and south, digital and material, ground and cloud. In both of our contexts, the rural and the urban are permeable and enmeshed as the architectures of Jordan's smart grid traverse desert landscapes far beyond the city's edge, as you see in the image here, and as the continuation of rural life in Myanmar is made possible in part by circular labor migration and urban linkages. In linking these infrastructures, we seek to draw out the intertwined histories of development intervention and decolonial struggle that formatively shape how ongoing processes of capitalist transformation come to matter. So how do we think relationally about convergent and divergent dynamics of smart development in the post-colonial world? Drawing particular inspiration from the post-colonial scholarship of Gillian Hart, we make two key interventions. First, we provincialize contemporary smart projects within longer histories of development. This allows us to make sense of these infrastructures as new conduits for old projects of capitalist accumulation and interventionist improvement. And so the key for us here is to think relationally about the rooted material and discursive infrastructures 
that connect smart systems in seemingly disparate geographies. So the networks of development expertise, the circuits of international finance, and the techno-optimistic discourses that kindle dreams of smartness. Second, we ground smartness in longer struggles over land, labor, and livelihoods. This enables us to locate smart development within post-colonial landscapes marked by distinct dynamics of dispossession and interconnection. And here, the key for us is to move beyond a top-down view of power to think instead through the daily practices, the lived realities, and the aspirations of place-based place actors, and really to center these struggles in shaping how smartness unfolds. So over, over to Hillary. Thanks, Kendra. So with this framing, we'll turn out to the ways in which the smart grid and the smart farmer were imagined, built, and inhabited in our sites. The 2010s were a moment in which the promise and perils of digital technologies became a central global concern. And euphoric promises of democracy played a key role in channeling international investment into smart energy in Jordan and telecommunications in Myanmar. Although half a world apart, these capital flows unleashed parallel processes of digital material transformation. So you can see some of the outcomes or symptoms of this process in the images here. On the left, um, an advertisement for an agricultural extension app that was started uh, by a Myanmar startup in around 2014. And on the right, online mobilization against rising electricity bills in Jordan. Jordan's international reputation as a regional island of stability and a key Western ally in the Levant was consolidated during the democratic uprisings of the Arab Spring. This strategic geopolitical position made Jordan a prime site for foreign direct investment into stabilizing the grid and bolstering energy security. Since 2010, Jordan has channeled over $4 billion into its landmark renewable energy and energy efficiency program. Energy investment flows radically remade the country's legal, regulatory, financial, and environmental landscape around the goal of reaching energy security through smart power. In practice, this meant hollowing out the public sector in the name of austerity while installing new sensors, wires, and monitoring systems aimed at the tech-savvy citizen and paid for by private finance. Myanmar's election of a civilian government after a half century of military dictatorship inaugurated the nation as Asia's last frontier. The country's natural net resources and strategic location between India and China captured the attention of foreign aid and international investors. Indeed, telecom privatization in 2014 sparked almost 3 billion of foreign direct investment in just two years. New digital connections brought millions of people online for the first time and enabled the smart farmer to become imaginable as a development solution for an agrarian nation. So on the screen here, you can see photos from um, an ag hackathon in Yangon in June of 2019. This was an event that was hosted by a Swiss impact hub and sponsored by the country's largest agrochemical corporation. The urban youth you see here pitching new apps to link farmers to markets represented an emerging cosmopolitan class that promised to harness technology to create profitable fixes to counter the authoritarian legacy of backwards agriculture. And while a lack of enduring reforms in both countries have cast a shadow over the euphoric promises of the 2010s, these smart imaginaries still had material effects. So the utopian visions uh, I've outlined here are broadly similar in Myanmar and Jordan and quite resonant with the type of smart imaginaries we've been discussing at the symposium. But what Kendra and I became more and more interested in as we did this work were the ways in which the construction of smart infrastructures took shape on particular terrains of historic inequality. Building both the smart grid and the smart farmer required massive investments in a myriad of everyday spaces as towers, sensors, and cables reconstructed kitchens, gardens, and streets. Both Myanmar and Jordan exhibit high degrees of wealth concentration and landlessness and have long histories of dispossession linked to racialized colonial administration and contemporary ethno-nationalist territorialization. So digital connections materialized within landscapes of acute inequality. Instead of leveling the playing field, these processes consolidated wealth and deepened exclusions. So I'll focus on just a few points from the Myanmar case where the privatization of telecommunications ostensibly dismantled the military government's monopoly, but in practice enriched military connected elites. 
Telecom's reform enabled the military to strengthen their control over critical technology, surveil the population, and stoke racial and religious violence. Building the internet meant erecting towers across the country, not only beside Buddhist pagodas, but also on rural landscapes that I study, which are marked by long histories of land conflict. Dozens of towers were built on military bases located in ethnic minority areas where the army has a long record of human rights violations. And I should say that this um, sort of uh, intersection and in, in meshing of the military and telecommunications has only become both more obvious and more dangerous since the military coup last year, a point that I'm happy to talk about in Q&A. So decades of land grabbing across the country meant that it was likely that hundreds of more towers were built in places that had unclear overlapping or contested land ownership. In Yangon, I chatted with the employee of a private security firm tasked with guarding the tower stashes of gasoline for backup generators, which she explained were occasionally pilfered to supply local motorbikes. So even in the cases without active civil war, towers introduced both new forms of armed security and new dimensions of inequality. By relying on the plots and the objects of the poor while enriching the elite, these smart infrastructures were woven into the longer histories of wealth concentration and dispossession. I'll turn now to the question of how these infrastructures are inhabited on the ground focusing on selective adaptations and refusals of smart energy in Jordan. Walking up Amir Rashid Street from the central bus station in Eastern Amman, you're likely to hear at least half a dozen Arabic dialects reflecting residents who hail from rural villages and towns in Syria, Iraq, Palestine, and Yemen, dislocated by war, settler colonialism, and imperial aggression. As smart energy reforms drive up electricity costs, Residents of this neighborhood opt to switch off their power. They turn instead to thick blankets draped across apartment windows and rugs that are wedged into the cracks of door frames to keep out the cold. These low tech, low cost home remedies are essential tools to sustaining life in the city. And we argue they're critical to how we think about the ontology of the smart grid, um, which is an idea that Kendra is exploring more in her work. These blankets demonstrate selective adaptations that show how smart development is intimately bound up with ongoing struggles to find work and make life within the precarious conditions generated by compounding waves of dispossession, dependent industrial development, and neoliberal reform. So here we've advanced an approach that starts from rooted power relations within interconnected post-colonial landscapes in order to foreground the histories of violent dispossession and ongoing equity struggles that shape the critical geographies of smart development. In closing, we wanna offer just a few implications of this approach for advancing the conversations we're having at the symposium. So first, I think this approach um, brings us beyond imagining towards building and inhabiting. This is really where the rubber meets the road when it comes to smartness. And it's in these towers and these blankets where we see what's at stakes with this type project. Second, while the dream of smart development may be global, the materialization is quite specific. Our own comparative work invites further scholarship that thinks relationally from the post-colonial world in order to locate digital infrastructures within particular landscapes. And finally, we hope to open more pathways here for traversing the rural-urban divide. So this project came out of our frustration, actually reading the siloed literatures on smart cities and digital agriculture. And our work together shows that it's not primarily a rural urban divide here, but rather the specific character of rural urban interconnection that shapes the possibilities for smart development. So in conclusion, both Jordan and Myanmar uh, showed these imaginaries of smart development, which mobilized billions of dollars, but failed to deliver equitable entrepreneurial futures. This is not that surprising probably for many of us here today, um, but our work shows that smart development uh, furthermore becomes embedded in existing political struggles that are forged in dynamic landscapes. Telling stories of smart development from the post-colonial world is in and of itself a political act, one that unsettles universalizing narratives. By repositioning our vantage point and stepping back to consider the broader networks of material infrastructure and capital flows, we resituate smartification within a longer history of uneven and contested development. Thank you so much. We look forward to your questions.